we're on the home stretch for the 2020 year. Uh, future years are going to be, of course, going all the way through all nine units, but we stop at seven here uh, for 2020 because of the pandemic. So this one's going to focus on personality, and it's going to take a little bit to, to go through all of them, uh, but they want us to go through the various explanations for uh, personality and then what uh, we believe about it now and then what evidence we have for that empirically and how we test for it. So personality itself is actually uh, kind of defined as such. It is uh, essentially the, the characteristics, the, the things that make you like a character in a book, that's what makes it a character, the things that sort of define it, uh, the person in, in the book, like what kind of a person they are, uh, whether they're moral, immoral, according to you know, our standards, you know, the, the things that they do, the way they react things. That's what a, a character is in a book, uh, the idea you have in your head of them, uh, but that's kind of what characterizes us as well. So our personality is just like a character in a book, hence the word characteristic or characterization, uh, is where we have a set of generally consistent, not entirely consistent, but uh, generally consistent ways we behave. So certain ways that we think, uh, certain perceptions we have of other people in the world, uh, and uh, the thoughts, uh, and, and emotional experiences we have and how that affects our behavior. The, the words that we use, the goals that we set, um, the, uh, our actions basically are, are the behavior. So uh, that's kind of your personality. And you can kind of think about just about anybody. And obviously it's gonna change a bit as you grow, but if you think about people that are uh, further along developmentally, uh, whether they're teenagers or young adults or, or older versions of adults, they're generally pretty consistent in that you can kind of uh, not entirely accurately, but you can kind of imagine them in, in your head as far as how they would probably react to something uh, or something they would probably say or things they probably like uh, as opposed to what you like or other people like. Uh, that's their personality. So again, things they like, uh, perceptions, thoughts, emotions that, uh, that they experience uh, and how they see the world. And that, of course, is going to interact with uh, their thoughts. Uh, their uh, emotional experiences, and then their actual behaviors, uh, be it goals or uh, verbal actions uh, or physical actions in the world. That's your personality. So I was pretty um, complex, but basically your characteristic, characteristic, um, thoughts, perceptions, preferences, uh, and behaviors. Obviously, emotion uh, is going to play a role in that, uh, and behaviors that uh, tend to not define, but characterize, that are relatively consistent, there we go, that are relatively consistent in an individual. All right, so that's, that's your personality. And um, we, we've definitely come to the point that we realize there's no simple uh, explanation for this as we know in psychology in general. So there's not like, oh, your personality is dictated entirely by your biology and genes, nor is it dictated entirely by your uh, epigenetic uh, interactions with the environment, nor is it entirely uh, determined by your socio-cultural uh, environment. Um, and the presence of or lack of presence of other people uh, at a given time. Those are all factors that are not solely responsible for your personality. Um, we'll find that uh, the biological and then the epigenetic tend to be a bit more impactful, but the other two, uh, the situational uh, instances, as well as the environment that you're raised in, absolutely do have at least some impact on your, your personal development and and the manifestation of your personality. Um, so where we sort of begin this journey, and again, we're gonna kind of go through, kind of with historical perspective. Uh, that's the way they laid it out. I think that's a good logical way to go through it. Um, traditionally, personality had been just this idea that kind of human beings were, were put into the world, and then uh, you were essentially carrying out what, you know, God or the universe or whatever had out had planned for you, uh, and that any deviation from that, um, so people that were socially, they, they had some sort of psychological disorder or whatever, um, they would be not characterized by their own brain or personality or, or potential abnormalities, but it was usually explained by 
some sort of divine intervention, like, oh, they're possessed, they're being punished by God or whatever. So her behavior and ability was largely just sort of, uh, I don't want to say lazily, because they didn't have the information really to, to draw this, but uh, it, it was largely sort of believed that you inherited from God. Um, we had some changes, of course, with um, uh, John Locke and his blank slate idea. Um, you could even go back to Aristotle's thing we learned through experience, but <clears throat> that's, that's kind of the, the model we followed for most of uh, modern human, not modern, for human existence. Uh, just kind of understanding it as some process that's largely out of our control, even if it is shaped a bit by experience. Um, and, and to a degree, that, that's somewhat correct. But um, particularly in the 19th century, the 1800s, even the early 20th century, but certainly the, the, the late 19th century, people had this idea that humans and our, our behaviors were very uh, rational. And I don't mean like, oh, they're logical, like reasonable. I mean like <clears throat> they believed that we were these conscious beings that were aware of all of our desires and we had full control of our behaviors. And once we were educated and given a system where we could um, operate safely, that we would, uh, by definition sort of, or at least by character, by personality, whatever was, was ingrained in us, we would uh, only act that way that was uh, logically and rationally tenable. So that we'd only do things that would, would, would make sense, that would better our situation than the situations of others. Uh, and we would never have to wonder why we did something because we would always know why we did it if we'd know it was for you know, this good reason of, of enhancing, uh, flourishing, or reducing suffering or whatever it might be. And that is definitely an element of our brains, but it is not the only element. And the one to really come out and, and sort of debunk this theory, at least its existence entirely by itself, that again, we're these rational creatures that are fully aware of what we want and can fully realize why we act the way we act, and we, we only act in a way that is um, consistent uh, and um, uh, logical and, and rational, was uh, Freud, actually. So that's who we're going to kind of start with, at least the field we're going to start with. We're going to start with um, we've psychoanalytics. Yeah, psychoanalytic. Psychoanalytic. Uh, personality theory. And we're going to look at two guys mainly. We're going to look at uh, Sigmund Freud, who I already mentioned, <clears throat> and uh, Carl Jung, one of his pupils that uh, would uh, they would have a disagreement basically uh, about their theories of the human mind uh, and the psyche, uh, which is really just the human mind, and it, that would cause them to have this rift and, and split in pursuing their own uh, answers or explanations for how the, the brain worked, or how we worked anyway, uh, how our mind worked and how we, why we behave the way we behave. Uh, so Freud's the first one to break from this. So um, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, Sigmund Freud, I might have his, his birth years off. I know he died in 1939, because I always remember that, because like, he died right before World War II, or well, technically the same year it began, but uh, Sigmund Freud, um, he was, I think it was like 1854 maybe, or around there, till uh, 1936. So that's kind of a when he was around. And uh, he's going to propose an alternative uh, to the theory that, again, we're these rational creatures who understand who we are, what we want, and we only act according to those known desires. Um, he's going to propose that, uh, he's going to reject idea of a fully Conscious, so conscious meaning aware, of, like I know what I want and why I want it, which is, I think you'll know if you really think about it, you know that's not true. There's definitely instances in your life when you do something or want something, and it's not quite clear to you why you do that or want that, um, especially after the fact, especially if something goes wrong. Uh, you think back, like, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Why did I, you know, uh, decide to do that thing uh, or neglect this thing uh, over a long period of time, and now I'm you know, suffering the consequences. We're not always aware of why we do or don't do things. Uh, and then sometimes if we try to think back as to why, we might come up with an answer or find something to avoid, but uh, we're not fully conscious of it and it's not always going to be rational and reasonable. So uh, we are, reject the idea of a fully conscious, uh, rational human psyche. And when I say psyche, I really just mean the human mind. And that's sort of an amalgamation or a combination of your uh, thinking and, your, and your, your preferences and your perceptions all kind of put together. Uh, the things that drive you, that, that carry you through the world. 
perceive it and act in it. All right, um, so he's gonna reject that idea. And again, he's not gonna entirely say that we're purely uh, the opposite, but he's gonna suggest that actually we are driven perhaps even more so uh, by forces that we are not aware of uh, and that are not actually logical and rational uh, computations that dictate our behavior. So he's gonna be a proponent <clears throat> of the uh, irrational. Again, I don't wanna say he purely thought this is how we acted but he's going to suggest this is a large part uh, and the most significant part of our behavior. So he's going to propose that uh, the human mind, the psyche, is driven largely by unconscious uh, desires. Not just unconscious, unconscious and irrational desires. Uh, he's gonna focus a lot on the pleasure. So here, here's an example. Um, we use, I use this example a lot because it fits a lot of things in psychology, but it fits for this one as well. So let's say that um, you uh, have this goal of going to a school and getting a job and uh, college and going to a, getting a job that pays a lot, whatever doctor or whatever it is you wanna be. Um, you know that there's that that's a long pathway. If you, even if you haven't thought about it, if you think about it now, you're like, yeah, that's a lot of years and a lot of tests and a lot of studying, a lot of papers, etc. Going all the way through to years later, you ending up in the spot that you uh, think you want. So not only will you possibly change your idea later and realize that's not what you want, but uh, even if you do stay with it, it's a it's a long pathway. All right. So if we were purely rational creatures and we we're fully aware of all of our motivations, we would align our lives with that. Uh, that uh, goal perfectly. You might have some sub goals too that you want to maintain. Obviously, we're not like uh, uh, these monofactorial things that move towards one single goal only. Uh, you're going to have to have maintain a relationship with your family, things like that. Um, but you'll find that if you really look at it, you you don't really align yourself that well with that goal. You might at certain times, and, and certain people might do a better job of that. But no one does it perfectly. So here's an example. Um, most of you, I'm sure, at some point in your life have uh, failed to uh, turn in an assignment uh, because you didn't feel like it or you forgot uh, or you didn't study and you didn't do as well on a test uh, as you could have or you failed to get up in time to go to some study hall or a rewrite or something like that. Uh, something that required you to make a, a sacrifice as far as your pleasure goes uh, and, and for some sort of long-term goal. Right? And that's, that's a rational way of thinking about, it. oh, I'm acting for the future and I'm orienting myself this way, so all my, my behaviors should line this way because that's what I want. That's the only thing I want. Um, you'll find that, that in your actual life, especially if you go back and track it, you're not gonna be that consistent. Uh, even the most consistent of us still have those days where we fail to uh, move towards that goal or that object. Uh, so the question is like, why do we do that? Because it doesn't make sense uh, to do that otherwise, especially when we want this thing. So it turns out that you know those days when you slack off and you don't do your homework or you don't turn it in on time or you forget uh, or you stay up too late uh, because you, you, you're out with friends or, or playing a video game or whatever uh, and then you're too tired to get up and go to school on time or go to a, a rewrite or say, or whatever it might be. Um, those are equally, if not more, a part of your life uh, and those almost never align rationally with what you want. In fact, those actually tend to uh, move you away from what you want. Uh, they're very irrational things that are usually just based on you trying to do something fun that, that feels good in the moment. It's like a pleasure-seeking impulse type thing. All right, so <clears throat> he's gonna argue that and um, his exact theories and the way they play out as far as development and uh, you know testing for all of the details of his theories are not gonna be uh, scientifically uh, verifiable. But what's important here is he does tap into this or, or, or point us in the direction that, yes, this is equally a part of our human minds. And it is, not in the way that he thinks so, <clears throat> but certainly as our brains and our, our human lives unfold, our brains develop and our human lives unfold, we become increasingly aware that uh, there's definitely the presence of both of these uh, in our lives. And he's going to focus particularly on these irrational and unconscious desires that we're not even aware of, uh, that are... Um, not in our best interest, at least in the long term, or in a society, uh, and they, but they still impact our behavior. Okay, so he believed that 
and I've mentioned this before in an earlier video, at least briefly, uh, he believes kind of in a three, thinking of the human mind uh, as three parts, not necessarily like, you know, three parts of your brain, but within your brain, however it existed and, and, and operated, there was kind of three elements to it. So the first is the one that's gonna be dominated by these unconscious, uh, or these irrational desires, these pleasure-seeking ones. And it's gonna be unconscious, meaning I'm not aware of it. Uh, it makes me want to do things and sometimes compels me to do things, but I don't exactly know explicitly what it wants. I can't be like, oh, this is my selfish impulse right now, and I want this for this reason. No, you just feel it, and sometimes you go with it, and sometimes you don't. So that's gonna be uh, what he refers to as the id. And this is the part of your brain that is the most egocentric. And if you forgot what that term meant, means, that means you're pretty much not aware of the rest of the world. Um, so it, it's centered around ego, the self, you. Uh, it doesn't see others. It doesn't care about others. Um, and that doesn't mean that it's necessarily evil, per se. Uh, but it's just not aware of others. It's only aware of you and fulfilling your desires. So this id is very, what you would call, uh, selfish, obviously. Uh, it's pleasure-seeking, uh, and it's impulsive. So it's always going to capitalize on short-term gain, right? It, it, it's, it's very irrational. It's like, oh, donut, I like that. It's going to eat it without regard for, um, or the desire to eat it anyway, exists without regard for uh, any knowledge of how it will actually play out. Um, so it only knows about you and what you want, uh, but it also doesn't think about how things will play out. So it's, it's missing two features here. So let's give the donut an example. There's a donut on a plate and I go, and I see it and I go, oh, and then I should eat it. All right. So there's two things I didn't, if I just eat it without thinking, there's at least two things I'm not factoring in. Uh, number one, if I'm in a room with other people and let's say if I've had a donut and there's only one left, um, I might make others upset if I take the last donut of course, without um, uh, considering if everybody else has had one. Um, now, I'm not saying you have to give up a donut so somebody else can have one, but let's say you've already had one uh, and there's only one left and a couple other people have not, so you go and take it. I think we can agree that if they wanted it, that that would be selfish and people would frown upon that. So that's an example of egocentric. I didn't write it up there. Oh, selfish, I guess that's kind of what egocentric though. Because again, it's not even just that you're you only want to please yourself. It's this, these desires aren't even aware of other people uh, and their desires. Uh, just like the example I gave of the kid where you, you, he's on the one side of a volcano. Uh, he's like a, a three-year-old or whatever. It's an adorable video, but you got this kid on one side of the volcano and then this, uh, uh, this experimenter on the other side. And she says, oh, what do you see? And he sees like these three things, like a tree, a cat, and a lake or whatever. And she says, what do I see? And then it's totally different, the stuff she can see, but the kid, is unaware of her perspective and just says, states the, oh, the, 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 I already forgot what I said, cat, the lake, and the tree, or whatever, uh, even though the, the lady can't see it. He's just not aware of her perspective. Uh, that's kind of what this is. So I ate the donut, um, and that desire to eat it uh, is definitely selfish, but uh, the desire itself isn't aware of others, and that, you know, you need to allow uh, them to have an opportunity, uh, and that's going to be frowned upon if you don't. Uh, but it's also not going to think about Practically, like reality-wise, let's say, let's say uh, uh, it's still egocentric, so I'm not aware of other people, uh, but there is a sense, in, uh, as far as reality goes, that I should at least act in my own best interest. Uh, so let's say I have diabetes and I already had a donut. Uh, that's probably already pretty risky, uh, depending on you know my blood sugar and, and other details. But certainly, just gobbling down a second one um, is going to be potentially really bad for my health. The impulse doesn't know that. The impulse just goes, oh, donut, I like, and then wants to experience the pleasure. So uh, it's, first of all, not, not realizing the moral issues of, of taking something that somebody else has not had a chance to enjoy when you've already enjoyed it, but it's also not aware of the realistic implications, even to you, um, in that uh, if I eat this, it could endanger my life. It doesn't even know that. It just goes, I want the donut, and then it you know eats the donut, and, and, it, and it feels good to get that dopaminergic, dopaminergic, uh, dopaminergic. I have trouble saying that word, uh, reward center that activates. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm gonna say it's characterized by two things, a uh, lack of awareness, um, that, that's the egocentrism. I guess I could put that down here. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's egocentric, uh, so it's um, unaware of others, or even morality, because morality is largely based on how you interact with other 
people or creatures. Um, and it's also um, unaware of reality, i.e. like um, how it could harm you, regardless of others. That's an important distinction to make if you're trying to understand Freud, too, because the next step is aware of the realistic, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not realistic interpretation. It's aware of the real world. So, like, it knows that eating the donut could, you know, uh, uh, spark your diabetes and um, cause you to uh, potentially die or, or negatively affect you. Uh, but it's not going to be aware of other people and, and morality and what, what's right and wrong. All right, so again, we can probably agree that selfishly taking the donut when others have not had a chance to, and you've already had one, would be potentially immoral. Uh, most people would agree. Uh, but the uh, next series isn't aware of that at all. So it's not aware of the morality of the issue, but it is aware that if I eat this, I could jeopardize my health uh, because of my diabetes or whatever it might be. So this is the uh, uh, unconscious desire that pushes a lot of our behavior. But I think you can realize that if you just... Every time you had an impulse, a selfish one that was seeking pleasure, um, and you just capitalized on it, you'd, you'd die pretty quick. Um, because we have a couple drives that, that Freud kind of points to. Um, I kind of forget the, the Greek gods they were named after. Oh, one of them is like Thanos, like Thanacros or something like that. Uh, and the other one starts with an E. Uh, it doesn't matter. I know what the themes are. Um, he thinks there's kind of two drives. One is a uh, is a um, pleasure-seeking one, like a life-preserving one, seeking uh, preservation. Um, so that's the one that you know it, it it feels good to eat these these things or do these activities, and therefore I'm going to do them. Um, but there's also one that's a destruction-seeking. This is kind of like thrill-seeking. Um, this one's driven. This one's driven by us trying to enjoy life and and, and dri driving pleasures from it. So living is a part of it. Uh, but the destruction-oriented one uh, is doesn't necessarily mean you want to die, although that that's part of what he talks about. But this is the one where you'll risk your life to experience something thrilling. Uh, would be an example of one. So those people that. Um, do things that are really risky, like things that could kill them, uh, just to get the rush and experience it. Uh, and, and again, they're, what's the word I'm looking for? C certainly irresponsible. Um, reckless, there we go, that's what I was looking for. These would be the reckless behaviors, the people that you know drive really dangerously just because it's fun. Um, and when I say danger, I mean she's fast, but like, uh, they drive really fast, but like, you know, they'll, they'll blow stop signs or red lights or you know, they'll, they'll play chicken with oncoming cars and all things that I'm not, I'm saying don't do, obviously. Uh, but those are, that, that'd be a thrill-seeking behavior that was uh, destructively oriented because the threat is you uh, destroy yourself and others um, in, in doing this. Uh, that would also probably be the desire too to like, uh, you know, want to just, people like watching demolition of buildings. Uh, that would be another destructive oriented impulse, right? People like seeing the dynamite blow up and the building come down. Um, that, that would be an example of that too, I think. So uh, we've got these, these, these uh, kind of conflicting, but nonetheless selfish drives that are constantly being carried out. And I think we can agree that if you just carried out uh, every time you had this impulse, uh, whether it was destructive oriented or, or pleasure oriented, that uh, it would result in you, of course, ending your life much quick, more quickly than you would want to. Um, you wouldn't even reach adulthood, most likely, if you just carried... In fact, you wouldn't if you just carried these out every single time. Uh, in fact, I mean, I've got an infant son. If I just let him do whatever he want, I mean, he would unfortunately not be alive because babies will just be like, oh, that's cool, and they'll just eat it, right? And that could be toxic or too big for them, or, you know, they could fall off of an edge. Um, you know, they could touch something that would electrocute them, whatever it would be. Um, if you just go with it, uh, you're not going to make it to uh, adulthood or even childhood. All right. So that's one factor, and that's a major factor that's constantly wanting us to do things that um, realistically and morally are not in our best interest. All right, so you've always, always got these signals coming out, and you're not aware of them, or at least the reason why. Um, but one thing that's going to mediate this is what we refer to as the ego. Uh, this is one that... 
He gives the name self because this is kind of what carries out the behavior. There's another filter too, the superego, which we'll get to, but that one's almost entirely conscious, like you're aware of it. Uh, the ego is also more or less unconscious. This is what you actually carry out. Um, and it's kind of a filter on the id. In fact, it is a filter on the id. Uh, it's not entirely a filter, but it is a filter. And again, this is the realistic one. This is the one that realizes I want these things, but I can't have all of them. At least not this time, because it could kill me, right? You know, whatever it might be. Um, but it's still not aware of the, it's still not aware of the moral implications. So this one's not aware of, or necessarily cares about, um, but more so not aware of the, the taking the donut because others haven't had a chance to enjoy it when you already have. It's not concerned with that, but it is concerned with the, oh, that might actually spark my diabetes and cause me uh, to, uh, to, to, to die or, or, or suffer other adverse effects uh, or just suffer in general. Uh, so this one is um, uh, an unconscious sort of mediator uh, that carries out behavior. But it is aware of, of reality in that, you know, what is, what is life threatening, what is, what is practical. Uh, so it is somewhat uh, close, certainly closer to a connection with reality. So it's like the impulse and the ego's what your actual actions re reflect, right? That's the thing that actually causes you to go and do the thing. So again, you might not be aware of it, but it is at least partially or closer to or connected with or aware of, of reality and it'll hold back on some of these things. So it will know that some of these things are unacceptable, uh, specifically things that are a, th a threat to your own existence uh, or impossible. It'll put those back down and say no. Uh, but the one that you are gonna be aware of uh, is one that forms later in life. Uh, Freud, I believe, said it started in age four to three, or sorry, uh, four to five. That was the superego. And this is the one that's imposed on you consciously uh, by society. I mean society like just kind of your own culture and society, um, generally of course starting through your parents uh, and how they would you know punish you for certain things uh, but not for others and reward you for certain things. This is where you become, start becoming aware of those dynamics and what they are. Uh, because you know, for example, they're able to think about it first of all, because if you punish an infant by putting them on timeout, they'll have no idea why they're on timeout. They won't know what a timeout is, they'll just know that they're suffering and you're being mean. A four or five year old's definitely gonna still think you're mean for punishing them, but they know there's a reason for it uh, or it's something they should avoid doing. They, they will know why that they are being punished. Maybe not morally, maybe not understand why the rule is there, but they'll understand this is the rule. If I break it, I get punished. Um, so this, this is where you start to form what you would refer to, I guess, as uh, a moral, We'll just say your morality, morality. And again, that's usually gonna be um, acquired socially. And what I mean by that, again, is your culture, you know, parents, and what I mean by culture is like the kind of rules you have uh, in, in your area, whether it's religious or it's philosophical or, you know, because if you're raised here in the United States, it's a different set of social norms than if you're raised in Italy or China or uh, Zimbabwe or wherever you're raised. Uh, there's a different set of like norms, uh, things that are acceptable or unacceptable uh, to other people. Uh, and that's kind of what I mean by that. And then of course your parents too are gonna be a part of enforcing like, no, you, uh, we don't take from others. No, we don't bite. No, we don't scream. No, you're supposed to share. You know, you don't steal that sort of stuff. They, they uh, impress those beliefs on you. And that, of course, helps you to form uh, a conscience, which is this sort of awareness uh, of, um, or consciousness of your existence and the existence of others, uh, and how you should live to uh, best exist, coexist with them. All right, so you could say there's a, a tinge of selfish uh, desire there, because you know if, if you're good to them, they'll be good to you. Um, but it's more than that. It's, it's also maintaining it for everybody else. So everybody can get enjoyment, not just you. All right. So that's going to be your sense of a conscience. What, what's right and wrong, what you should and shouldn't do as far as, you know, stealing or yelling or biting or being violent, things like that. Uh, those are the early easy ones to, to weed out. Um, uh, but also to, uh, the, uh, the sort of sense uh, of an ideal self or behavior. And I mean that in a moral sense. 
It's not like you know the rules, but you, but you know, uh, you sort of have a vision of how you should and others should behave. You, you kind of form a moral code. Again, it's going to be impressed upon you by parents and culture, but you'll, you'll form that as your own, on your own as, as life goes on too. So this one we're aware of. This one's very conscious. Like you know the rules. Uh, you, you know why they exist. You know the, uh, the practicality of it. Um, so that one's a, a more conscious existence of your mind. And again, this is the three parts. Ego, not conscious, so it's part of your unconscious. This is what carries out the behavior, right? So you'll have this impulse. Uh, you'll kind of check it to reality if it's like, you know, too dangerous or not. Uh, and you'll also check it consciously for if it's the right decision, uh, meaning you know, is it a moral or immoral decision? Uh, will I get in trouble for it? That sort of thing uh, would be, uh, uh, and why those rules exist. All carry into the ego factored in, and the ego sort of... Uh, creates or manifests the behavior. Manifests, like, you know, make it real. So, uh, we, we use that terminology a lot, latent and manifest. Latent means, like, underlying, hidden. Um, so, it'd be, like, some sort of goal that's not expressly stated. So, like, let's say I, um, I, I'm a ruler of a country and I start enforcing a curfew because there's too much crime or something like that. Um, so, the, 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 the stated goal is, oh, we're going to uh, have this curfew to keep everybody in at 10 or 9 p.m. or whatever because of all this crime in whatever city or region. Right? That's the explicit stated goal. Uh, but the latent goal, the hidden one, might be um, that uh, I actually just want to uh, exercise greater control or authority uh, or I want to uh, allow uh, people to become familiar or accustomed to uh, government authority, or I'm trying to do something with my regime at night that I don't want people to be aware of, so, something like that. That would be the kind of hidden, latent, uh, uh, latent uh, desire that maybe even I'm not aware of as the leader, and I'm, I'm issuing that order, uh, but uh, that's what a latent would be. Manifest would be to make it actually happen. Um, so let's say I did uh, create a curfew as a leader of a regime, uh, and I even maybe even myself believed that it was because I wanted to, to help you know, reduce crime in the city or area or whatever. Um, but I'm actually pleased by it because uh, now I get to uh, tell people what to do uh, and I really enjoy having authority. Uh, so that's the actual latent desire. And I'm manifesting that by ordering the, uh, uh, the, the curfew at night. So the curfew, even though I might even think it's because I want to reduce crime, it's actually because I really like uh, having control of other people uh, and I'm allowing that to manifest even if I don't know that's why, uh, by issuing this curfew and enforcing it. So, those are the three um, parts of the human psyche uh, and, and how aware you are of them. So again, it's kind of like a, a step up each time. No awareness of, uh, of, of reality and immediate threats. It's just purely seeking pleasure, whether it's destructive or, or uh, you know, more constructive uh, pleasure. And also no idea about how other people, um, how the morality of it, the perspectives of the people, not aware of it. Ego, still not aware of the morality and the perspectives as much, but I am much more aware of, of, of the realistic implications in that I can't carry all of these out because it'll kill me or I don't have time or whatever it might be. And then the fully conscious or aware portion would be the superego, which can uh, stop some of these desires from occurring because you're aware of either the consequences or the fact that it's uh, immoral to do so, uh, and you understand the reason for those rules and, uh, and constraints. So that's how he, he believes it operates. What you would sort of characterize the previous belief, where did I write it? up here, um, that we're fully conscious and rational, you would think that this was entirely human behavior right here. And then we, we all understand why, and we all act according to that understanding of why. Uh, but Freud's going to be right, not with this layout per se. But he is right that we have some very conflicting, irrational, unconscious drives that are also constantly um, attempting to manifest themselves, uh, and we don't always know about them, and we don't always stop them uh, if they are uh, inappropriate uh, or, or harmful to, to ourselves or others. Uh, so that's kind of his explanation for it. So having an understanding... He's going to say this is the determining factor in people's behavior. It's going to depend personally, uh, as opposed to his, his, uh, his uh, apprentice and, and later um, uh, master of his own works, uh, Carl Jung. 
he's going to think it's a very personal uh, thing within each person. Uh, that um, you may you, you do inherit some of these selfish instincts and, and primitive desires, uh, but it's you're not so much influenced by others as you are just experiencing your own internal struggle. Uh, so it's a personal unconscious um, awareness that you're you're trying to uh, find out. So the goal is, and I'll detail it here. Uh, the goal overall is to uh, find out what these are and how it's affecting uh, this, your ego. Because uh, is your ego basically just trying to hide a bunch of stuff that you can't let out because it's unacceptable? Um, uh, whether it's uh, the superego imposing some restrictions or the ego avoiding something because it's damaging or harmful or, or unacceptable. Um, they want to find out what those are and, and see if that's affecting your life negatively, basically. But you can't just be like, hey, what are those things? Like, what are the issues you have? Because you are not conscious of it. Uh, it's an unconscious uh, phenomenon, and you're not aware of exactly what these uh, desires are or what you, uh, why you would want them, uh, or even if they exist. Uh, you just know that something bad's happening in your life, and you want to fix it. Uh, and it's the job of you and the therapist, um, the psychoanalytical therapist, to figure out and decode what is really bothering you that you're either suppressing um, or repressing that is making you... Uh, affect your life negatively, what can't your ego handle uh, or your super, super ego allow that is being pushed back down uh, and not allowed to be carried out? Because uh, they kind of believed in the idea that if you ignored it and suppressed it for so long, it would just constantly build and then it would find a way uh, to let itself out in your life, whether you're aware of it or not. Uh, that's where the manifesting and latent uh, comes from. So we'll, we'll get to that in a second. So this is kind of the layout. So the idea is, that an eraser. The idea is that your life, you go through these struggles between the three, um, and you are in particular unaware of the especially id, um, but even perhaps the ego to some degree, and that becomes your defining features. Uh, uh, to what degree are you suppressing or allowing or integrating uh, the, the selfish parts of you? Uh, or the id, I guess you would say. So, um, Freud pointed out that uh, most people are very averse to or, or dislike uh, discomfort and tension. So uh, people are, are motivated to avoid tension uh, or discomfort. I mean physically and mentally, but he's referring to mentally. So you're not going to want to do things that make you feel uncomfortable uh, because you're afraid others will judge you or you're afraid it'll affect you negatively or maybe it will directly make you uh, affect you negatively by making you feel sick or making you feel guilty or whatever it might be. Uh, so he believed that we, in an attempt, or our ego anyway, in an attempt to uh, avoid all this uh, tension and anxiety, that's another word, by the way, uh, he uses for anxiety. Uh, it would just attempt to push down or keep us unaware of things that would produce uh, anxiety or discomfort or tension. Oh, the markers are running out. Let's try this red one. Uh, so, well, I don't want to say our life is defined by, but certainly part of our life is defined by um, uh, the ego constantly, constantly. Um, diverts or suppresses or represses suppresses um, undesirable or uh, uh, anxiety inducing desires from the it. So basically means that uh, let me appear there. Basically means that you are constantly desiring to do things that either you can't practically do because it's impossible, it'll kill you, harm you, whatever, uh, or maybe including some interactions with the um, super ego. Um, they're undesirable in that uh, they will negatively impact you or they're not socially acceptable, whatever it might be. So you're having these constant buildup of impulses and desires that you can't actually manifest, you can't actually carry out. So what your ego does 
is it either pushes them back down to the id, doesn't allow you to, to, uh, to uh, um, uh, carry it out, uh, or it does it in a way so that you're not aware of it. So you can like go th through the day thinking, oh good, I didn't do this bad thing, right? Um, it, it'll either push it back down and, and sort of ignore it, suppress it, repress it, and the id, and keep it there, or it'll carry it out in a way that you're not aware of, but you still carry it out. All right, so um, <clears throat> you're constantly, your ego is constantly using what they're called, what they call defense mechanisms. So uh, ego achieves this avoidance of uh, these uh, undesirable or unacceptable um, behaviors and desires, avoids uh, anxiety or tension by suppressing I'm repeating myself a bit. Oh, Achieves avoidance, there we go, through the use of defensive mechanisms. So here are some of the defensive mechanisms your, your ego will use um, to take these urges from your id, the selfish part of you that's unaware of others and, and, and reality largely, um, it will block them entirely from your, from your knowledge. You won't even know that they exist, even though they're still there, causing damage potentially, stored in your unconscious. Uh, or it will um, craftily uh, carry it out in a way that you're not aware of. So um, one of the sets of defensive mechanisms, well, we'll go through a few of them. Uh, there's, I think, about 10. We won't go through all 10. But there's basically these ways that your ego can kind of cover up or... Uh, prevent you from being made aware of these uh, undesirable or unacceptable um, anxiety-inducing behaviors um, covertly. So here's a few ways that they can do that. So the defensive mechanisms, again, uh, and this is going to be how uh, you either, um, defensive mechanism is, of course, a, a strategy uh, to ignore, suppress, or carry out desire without conscious awareness. So this is not a, a good long-term solution. You're either gonna keep shoving it down back to the unconscious till it just kind of um, accumulates and, and explodes, potentially, uh, which, we'll, which we'll see here and talk about in a second, or it, again, allows you to carried out in a way that you're not aware of. So uh, let's start with the ones that are just pushing it back down. So there is, um, and these are both similar. There, there is a distinction between the two, but we're just gonna lump them into one. Uh, repression. Um, suppression would be more so you're consciously um, putting the thought aside. Um, repression would be in more unconscious mechanism, but in both cases, you're just essentially dismissing the thought or desire and you're just pushing it back down uh, into the uh, unconscious. So this would simply be you just, of course, um, uh, pushing back a, uh, a, an unacceptable desire to the unconscious. Um, another one could be... Um, Intellectualization. Okay, so let's say uh, you had to do something that was unacceptable or traumatic to you. All right, because they can either be uh, undesirable or traumatic. Because obviously something that's traumatic is going to be also anxiety inducing. You you feel guilty about what you had to do or you know it was wrong or whatever it might be. Um, so let's say, for example, uh, you were one of the pilots uh, for the uh, atomic bombs on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There was an explicit reason for doing that. Um, there was actually two. There was one to, to potentially save more lives, more lives than um, a, uh, uh, an actual invasion would, would uh, result in, uh, as far as casualties. So you'd lose a much more American soldiers invading mainland Japan, certainly a lot more Japanese civilians and soldiers as well. Uh, so one of the reasons why we dropped the bombs was to end the war quicker, uh, and even though, of course, the people that died from the bomb suffered and died, it would save more lives in the long run. We're also doing it, too, to 
sort of end the war more quickly so the Russians got less territory in East Asia. Um, nonetheless, if you're that pilot, you know it, and, and those are legitimate reasons, as in they're not like made up, uh, they were thought of beforehand, um, and you could logically weigh them and say, okay, the loss of life from invasion as opposed to the loss of life from atomic bombing, uh, it's much less for the bombing, we'll go ahead with it. Um, but that doesn't mean that the bombers themselves, or the people that crafted the bomb, whatever, might not feel, might not feel guilty about the actual uh, bomb itself being dropped and all the people dying in the various ways they did. From instant evaporation to the point you don't feel any to the people that were, of course, uh, horrifically uh, you know, deformed and, and suffered from uh, pain and burns and later on uh, you know, uh, nausea and, and, and cancer and other uh, radioactive uh, related diseases. Uh, you might feel an immense amount of guilt if you watch that and you know that you made that bomb or dropped that bomb, even if it was for a, a reason that was, was rational. So intellectualization is you don't deny you did it or repress it, but you just separate yourself from the emotional part of it. So the part that is you thinking about how it affected them and what it actually meant to the people that got hit by the bomb, uh, you would think about purely, oh, well, uh, that doesn't matter. It needed to be done. Right? You, you just sort of separate the two, the emotional part from the rational part, and focus just on the rational part. It's like, well, we need to do it to end the war quicker and we save more lives. Um, so you're, you're, you're aware of the um, emotional toll uh, and the implications, but you just sort of dissociate yourself or those set of facts from what you did. Like, yeah, 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 I, that, that's bad, but I did it because it saved more in the long run, that sort of thing. That'd be intellectualization. So. Uh, Separating the emotional uh, uh, burden from uh, the logical or uh, intellectual uh, components. Uh, so again, you might feel guilty if you thought about the actual bomb and how it affected those people because the people that were hit weren't necessarily part of the war. They were potentially, almost certainly a, a large portion of them were completely innocent uh, as far as the war effort goes. Um, other than, you know, paying taxes, but um, uh, they could potentially not experience that discomfort or anxiety by, of course, separating it logically in their head, the emotional aspect from the need to be done, did it for war, for the greater good sort of thing. All right, we're going pretty slow here, but whatever. Uh, three would be reaction formation. These aren't in any particular order, by the way. Reaction formation. This one is one of the harder ones for people to understand. Reaction formation is where you can't deal with a certain feeling, whether it's hatred or guilt or whatever. So you then shift your focus from one uh, emotion or, or fear or anxiety inducing uh, to one that is different, uh, and sometimes opposite. So you don't have to deal with it. So here's an example that probably didn't help you at all, but here's an example. Um, if I'm in a situation where I can't help it, like I, 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 I'm stuck in a situation where, oh, I read an example from uh, the Holocaust where you have these you know, Jewish and Slavic and other uh, ethnicities that are prisoners to the Nazis in these death camps uh, or concentration camps. And they know uh, that they're, after a certain, amount of po a certain point, they immediately arrive, they don't know, but after a few days, they definitely know that they're going to die there, uh, probably worked to death first if they survived the initial days, uh, after 1942 anyway. Um, but they were, they were there to die. They were hated by and despised by the, the SS uh, and the Nazi upper uh, uh, administration. So some of them, because there's nothing they could do about the situation, um, they would turn that resentment or hatred or fear into uh, affection. Like some of them, and this is really weird, some of them uh, actually developed these uh, kind of obsessions with some of the guards, which are obviously there uh, to make sure that they uh, do their work and, 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 and die according to this, this uh, campaign and system. Uh, they would actually become affectionate for those guards, even though, of course, they uh, should have no reason to be. And they would like uh, collect little bits uh, from the from the guards they had as favorites, like whether it was their trash or whatever it would be. Uh, they would just collect little pieces of it because they uh, really cared about or loved that person, uh, even though 
that's the opposite of how they should feel. So what Freud would say is, since they have this hopeless despair or fear or hatred for the person, and that they can't, they can't just exist with this constant state of discomfort and hatred, that they actually just shift that to one that is uh, acceptable, uh, which could be uh, some sort of uh, love or affection uh, in the context of that, of that camp. Another example, Stockholm Syndrome, which is like where somebody's kidnapped or captured, and after a long time they end up falling in love with their captor. Uh, that would be another example. It's a very similar situation where you're hopelessly stuck in the situation and you're very fearful or you're very um, uh, angry about what this person might do, fearful for your life or angry that they took you. But you realize after a certain point that uh, you can't just sit there and constantly every day fearful of being, fearing dying or, or being angry because you were taken. So eventually you just decide to consciously or unconsciously, um, or be unconsciously because it's your ego, to avoid that, that conflict, that tension, that anxiety, you would just uh, develop some sort of affection or love or appreciation for your captor, even though they have uh, nefariously captured you and taken you away. But at least if you care about them or think they care about you or you have some sort of relationship, you're not worried about them harming you or, or whatever. So that's what, that'd be an example reaction formation. So uh, um, how can we phrase this one? Uh, forming a new uh, set of beliefs or feelings or directing a new set of feelings in order to avoid uh, anxiety inducing beliefs or feelings, All right? And that's what you're trying to do, uh, avoid those things, that avoid that tension. Okay, uh, another one would be sublimation. Sublimation is uh, simply when you carry out your, you have an unconscious uh, drive that's, that's uh, an impulse from the id that's unacceptable. Like let's say aggression, like you like, you like, uh, uh, hurting things or people, like you have the desire to do that. But you know you can't, um, your ego knows that first of all, because if you do that, uh, you're gonna get uh, killed in return, right? Because if you go around fighting and killing people, then even if there's no society, the people that are around are gonna get back at you or their families will. So you can't just go do that. Uh, so what it basically is, is, sublimation is you take this desire you have that's unacceptable, that you can't carry out, whether it's uh, morally you can't do it or, or realistically you can't do it, um, it's going to take that, that urge and that desire and change it into a socially acceptable uh, manifestation or, or way to carry it out. So, for example, let's say that you uh, really want to uh, uh, fight people and like just brutally murder them with, with swords, right? That's obviously not many people have that desire, but let's say you do. Um, you can't do that because you'll be punished and killed for that or somebody will kill you while they're not, but there are some things you could do where you could actually uh, cut people open. Uh, you could be um, a, um, a surgeon, for example. Surgeons can use that uh, uh, capacity to, to, to cut people open in a productive way, all right? We're trying, to, trying to fix them or treat them or whatever. Uh, or you could be a, uh, a mortician or someone who examines cadavers where you can deal with uh, dead bodies or cutting them open or whatever in a socially acceptable manner. So um, those are all ways, and those are obviously just jobs that certain people can't handle. Uh, but um, if you are driven to do that, Freud might say, or psychoanalysts might um, link that potentially to your choice of profession. Uh, so uh, finding a socially acceptable way, and that one dried out quick. A socially acceptable um, way to carry out unacceptable uh, desires. So again, if I liked cutting people up or killing them, um, I could be uh, a surgeon, and that's using it for in a way that's socially acceptable and actually productive, uh, or a mortician or some sort of crime scene investigator where you have to deal with that sort of thing. Uh, that would those would be socially acceptable ways of realizing that. But let's say you just were really aggressive and violent, wanted to fight people, maybe not cut them open. Um, you can't just go do that. You'll end up in jail or, or kill yourself. Uh, but you could potentially become a boxer or an MMA fighter, whatever it might be. And that's a socially acceptable way to, to carry out that aggression and, you know, preference for violence or whatever.
All right, uh, five would just be outright denial of the uh, harmful thought or conflicting uh, anxiety driving desire or traumatic experience, whatever it might be. Uh, it just um, denying something happened, denying something despite uh, evidence to the contrary, particularly overwhelming evidence. Um, so this is like, going back to judgment, this is like a belief perseverance thing. It's very similar, uh, if it's not exactly the same thing. But this would be like, uh, you've got a wife or husband or whatever, your partner, and uh, you love them and all that. And maybe even though things aren't going that well, but um, someone tells you that they saw them uh, cheating. They saw them on a date with or holding hands with or kissing somebody else or something else, something like that. Uh, when they told you they were on a business trip or staying late for work. Uh, denial would be uh, simply going, oh, no, no, that my, my wife or husband or whoever, would never, they would never do that, all right? Uh, and even if someone's got like, uh, you know, even if multiple people are telling you that, maybe there's even some footage of it, uh, you'd be denied, like, oh, no, that's, that's not him, actually. He was, he was over here, or he doesn't look like that, or he doesn't have that jacket or whatever. That's what denial would be, is clear, pretty clear facts or consensus about something that happened, but since it's so damaging, uh, to you, you would actually just deny it uh, as a way to avoid that um, uh, traumatic experience or, or unacceptable uh, desire. Uh, that'd be denial. Uh, what's another example? We've got displacement. This would be the last one we do. There's, there's, there's a few more, but we're just going to end with this one. Uh, displacement. This would be where um, I've got some residual or carried over... Um, traumatic experience or unacceptable desire, uh, and I can't carry it out the way I want to, so I just take that, that, that unacceptable emotion or thought or, or anxiety or whatever, and I, I, I uh, take it out on something else. So that would mean, like, let's say uh, uh, I, I, I've got a job at a factory or whatever, and I, I can't stand the way that uh, my boss is treating me or, or, or whatever. I'm very mad at my boss. Um, but it's probably an unwise, if you want to keep your job, uh, to go and have a fight verbally or physically with your boss. So you come home angry, uh, and you've got that pent-up anger that you want to release to your boss, but you can't. You know, it's, it's damaging as far as your job goes, or maybe it's immoral, whatever it might be, whether it's ego or super ego imposed. You can't do it. So what do you do? Potentially, uh, you take it out on something else that you could uh, release your anger or tension towards. So that could be maybe uh, you take out your anger uh, on your family, like you know, are mean or are angry with your, your kids or your wife or your animals, uh, or you, uh, you know, go out back and you know, uh, I don't know, destroy something or, 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 or chop, decide to chop wood that day and you don't need firewood, or maybe you do need firewood, but it allows you to like sort of take out your anger uh, on, the, on the wood that you're chopping or, or whatever it might be, uh, or, or you go shooting or you know, go out and start punching a punching bag. Those are all ways you can sort of take out your aggression and anger on something that is acceptable. Um, so that's what displacement is, uh, taking out unacceptable <clears throat> behaviors on acceptable or in acceptable manner or on a different different uh, thing or situation. So you're redirecting it to something else that you can take it out on or, or, or can carry out with. So th these are all these are all kind of interrelated but they but they are nuanced enough to have their own categories. But whether whether you're just rep repressing it or trying to disassociate it or you're carrying it out in a way uh, that is um, I guess you would say these are definitely forms of, of dissociating, uh, and potentially this one, maybe. Um, no, those are kind of like dissociating yourself, separating them, and then these are much more so finding other ways to carry them out. Um, but either way, you're avoiding some sort of trauma or anxiety-inducing behavior or memory or impulse, uh, and then you're finding a way to either push it back down, ignore it, or or dissociate, or you're uh, carrying out in a way that is socially acceptable. All those are defensive mechanisms, though. So your ego is doing these things and a few others, 
uh, but this gets the point across. He goes doing these things to protect you uh, from feeling uh, uh, dread and anxiety about, uh, again, the past traumas or unacceptable behavior or desires. So uh, that's one of the ways they can be carried out, and that's going to largely dictate, according to Freud, what you're actually doing in life. So you can kind of see, like, your behavior, and these are all behaviors and beliefs, uh, is determined by this interaction between the id, ego, and superego, and this tension between the, the three as your ego tries to, uh, um, and your superego try to um, uh, carry out uh, your behavior and, and carry out your desires. So, um, to Freud, these desires, um, or perhaps, if you recall, our developmental stages in the last unit, Freud going through all the way through oral, uh, anal phallic, all the way uh, to um, sexual maturity. If you're ever suppressing something, whether, like I said, it's an unacceptable impulse or desire or a traumatic memory or whatever, uh, or it's you know uh, a developmental stage you were fixated on, um, those are the things that dictate your behavior. So the job of a psychoanalyst would be to figure out what those uh, latent desires or traumas uh, or f uh, fixations are uh, and, and then try to see them by how are they manifesting themselves in your life uh, or, or other ways. So uh, the role uh, of psychoanalysis was uh, to decode the unconscious uh, desires or traumas that um, that manifested themselves. Maladaptively. So usually I mean by maladaptively. This is a way that affects your life negatively. So let's say uh, a past trauma. This is one of the one of his early uh, sets of experiments that really showed, gave some credence to his theories. Um, was uh, his his uh, work in theories with with shell shock from World War One. So during World War One, they had a phenomenon they called shell shock, where these uh, soldiers would go out and they'd fight in the trenches, which was Probably, if not, if not the certainly one of the most uh, miserable um, conflicts to be a part of and destructive. Uh, so these Germans and, and, and French and British uh, soldiers are all in these trenches fighting over and over and over for 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 four years, and there's relatively no progress. Uh, it's really just when you're carried out that you're just existing in misery, and slowly you suffer, and others around you suffer and die, and eventually you die too. And it really really impacted these guys. Uh, in, in ways that human beings had never really seen before. One of the things that was particularly odd was they would come back um, from service or they'd have to be uh, uh, released from service because of these maladaptive uh, behaviors. They would experience what was called shell shock where they would, um, there's different combinations of things, but I'll give you three common ones. They'd be completely blind, completely deaf, or both, uh, or they would uh, suffer from these uncontrollable tremors and shakes like if you sat them in a chair, they wouldn't be able to stop shaking, they'd fall off the chair or whatever. And obviously if you're blind or deaf or uncontrollably shaking, you can't operate uh, in the military as, as a soldier. But in all these cases, these uh, men were not physically or anatomically ill. Their eyes were fine, their ears were fine, uh, or their uh, nervous system was fine. But they still had these weird uh, disorders. Right? We call them psychosomatic disorders, where when your mind, issues in your mind are causing physical symptoms, and that's, that's what we're seeing here. Uh, but what it turns out was that uh, they were experiencing these symptoms because they had repressed or were avoiding, or their brain was attempting to repress or avoid, things that were so traumatic that uh, uh, they didn't want to have to deal with them anymore. So, uh, for example, they either heard or seen so many horrific things across time in these wars that despite their eyes and ears being okay, their brain, uh, as far as perception goes, in their, in their lobes, had just shut off their occipital or temporal lobes, at least the parts that deal with the uh, perception of the, the sounds and the, uh, uh, the sound waves and the light waves. Uh, so again, there's nothing wrong with them physically, there's just the brain stopped interpreting this, they, they 
conscious, unconsciously blocked it off. Same with the nervous system thing. They were trying to hold in these, uh, these terrible memories and these traumatic events that it was causing them to tremble in fear or shake uncontrollably, uh, even though they weren't aware of what those things were. And the weirdest part was uh, you could actually, and sometimes you did, uh, Freud and, and others that worked with him, uh, and according to his theories, they could actually cure some of these guys just by talking with them. So they could essentially go in and, and, and eventually figure out like what horrible things had happened uh, and it wouldn't just come out right away. They'd have to, you know, go through uh, to find the roots of these things. But once the uh, soldiers had sort of expressed what was really bothering them um, that they weren't aware of before, uh, and they'd sort of come to terms with it, then these symptoms would go away uh, with no medication or surgery or anything like that. Uh, so that's what the uh, um, uh, role of psychoanalysis became. Uh, and again, one of the uh, best um, examples of this was the uh, shell shock shell shock uh, treatments, which is really just talk therapy. So there's um, uh, a few different ways that they would go about doing this uh, that, that Freud laid out. Uh, so he believed that when these things are being suppressed into your unconscious, uh, you can't actually find out about, you can't actually like, decode them by looking at somebody's life, either getting them to recall things uh, or hypnotize them, although this, this actually didn't work out very well for him uh, and he abandoned it eventually. Uh, hypnotizing them and getting them to express these things, like somehow tapping into your unconscious and having it talk to you sort of thing. Uh, or by looking at your dreams, like the themes of your dreams, the, what, what keeps happening over what's in them, uh, and interpreting them to try to figure out what's bothering you, uh, that, that sort of comes out in those dreams. Or by using uh, projective um, uh, tests and, and therapy, uh, which, which I'll talk about here in a second. So um, they do this through the... Uh, uh, this, these things are decoded uh, through the use of uh, uh, um, uh, psychoanalytic therapy, psychoanalysis. All right, oh, that's a little redundant, but I'm going to list what they are. Um, here's some tactics they might use. Uh, they might look to uh, analyze um, behaviors behavior patterns. So they might look for some of those defensive mechanisms like sublimation, like, uh, oh, well, you know, look at your profession, what you do uh, on a given day, you know, and they might ask you about what you do actually on a given day, like if you're, if you're uh, uh, taking something out on something else, uh, whether they're, uh, or they're, they're experiencing some sort of um, misguided or uh, alternate emotion to replace one that's unacceptable, like the reaction formation. Or like I mentioned before, the displacement, uh, how they're you know taking it out on something else. Uh, so they analyze your uh, behavior patterns, uh, or uh, look for things called, uh, listen for things called Freudian slips, which are when you accidentally misspeak, but what you're misspeaking is actually your unconscious trying to communicate its desires. Uh, so like if I was counting, I said one, two, three, four, five, six. A Freudian slip might be if I was like you know trying to repress some sexual desires or something. Would be like, I would actually say like one, two, three, four, five, uh, six. No, I actually said six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Like you'd accidentally say the word sex instead of six. That'd be a Freudian slip uh, of this like internal uh, desire that you're pulling back because it's not acceptable. It just sort of comes out on accident. Um, so you analyze the behavior patterns of Freudian slips. You do that with therapy. Uh, they could try to um, uh, analyze your uh, uh, dreams, dream interpretation. So like, I think Freud actually labeled it the, the gateway to the unconscious, like the, the themes of and uh, events in your dreams sort of give you a window into your unconscious and what's, what's driving you. Um, you can also use, although you did ditch it pretty quickly, hypnosis. Uh, that wasn't a really good way to extract memories and communicate with the unconscious and the intention was to extract uh, repressed memories or even communicate with the unconscious to some degree. Uh, but this one's going to be the least reliable of these. Um, then there's just straight talk therapy um, through memory re recollection, uh, which is one of the things that was used with these um, uh, soldiers. Right? So just literally getting them to talk about all the things that happened, and eventually they come across these uh, you know, forgotten memories or 
express how much something was damaging or hurtful to them. Uh, and then that, that allows them to sort of like get it out in the open and it's no longer being um, suppressed or repressed into their uh, unconscious and they can go about their day now without this uh, blindness or deafness or whatever, whatever uh, maladaptive behavior that, that they're manifesting uh, unconsciously. Um, and then also uh, a tactic that's uh, gonna be a little bit more so developed later uh, called projective tests. Oh, well, that reminds me of one I forgot, one of the uh, defense mechanisms is projection. So like, let's say, for example, so imagine me adding up that list that I just erased. Um, so you have like displacement and then intellectualization, all these things, and one of them would be a projection where you have some sort of unacceptable desire, like say you like stealing things. Um, so what you do is you project that onto other people uh, and you start thinking, oh, everyone's a thief. Like, oh, I don't like that guy. He's a thief, even though there's no evidence for that. And really, you're just a thief yourself, but you can't deal with the fact that you are a thief and it's not practical or it's moral. So you just uh, project that, that unacceptable desire onto somebody else and then label them that and then be, maybe go after them for it uh, later. Uh, projected test. Uh, the idea here is you're trying to see how you are projecting your uh, inner traumas or uh, unacceptable desires uh, onto ambiguous uh, subjects. So ambiguous meaning like it's not clear what it means or what it is. Uh, so these generally refer to um, uh, patient would be would uh, describe or fill in uh, ambiguous images, scenes, uh, or or words or sentences saying. So one example would be uh, the, um, the thematic aperception test. Also known as the TAT test, invented by, I forget his first name, but I think it's Rorschach, the Rorschach test. This is where, um, you've all seen this before, like the ink blot test, where you pull up a, a, a piece of paper and it's got like this ink blot. Um, so what they would look for is some tendencies or habits, um, kind of along the lines of a Freudian slip, where if they give you something ambiguous, uh, you're going to explain or fill it with whatever uh, unconscious desires you have. So if they give you a, a picture of something that's really clear and obvious what's going on, you'll just say what it is. But if they give you an image of something that it's not clear what it is and you have to describe what it is, they'll think that uh, your attempt to describe it is going to show or allow you to manifest those 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 traumas or unacceptable desires um, that uh, you're you're harboring unconsciously. So let's say I'm super aggressive, uh, and that's one of my things, right? So I'm I'm really aggressive, but I'm constantly suppressing it because you can't just be aggressive all the time. So if they're like showing me uh, images, and I'm constantly coming up with things that are kind of destructive or, or violent or aggressive, like oh that looks like a bong or oh that looks like a tank or you know like but they're not. Um, they might notice that trend and then um, uh, conclude that I might be suppressing some uh, violent or aggressive tendencies or something like that. That's a projective test. Be. Another example would be, you know, they give you a statement uh, and you fill in the blank or they say they start a sentence and then you end the sentence uh, or um, they give you a picture of a, of, a, of a scene and it's not clear what's going on in the scene. Like there's people on hills and stuff and you have to tell a story about the scene like um, basically explaining it like, oh, well, the kid's there um, uh, with his kite, uh, and uh, over there is the mom, and then she's uh, not paying attention to him, so this guy over there in the, under the tree is going to go and kidnap the kid, and they might think, oh, well, then maybe, you know, you're dealing with these unresolved abandonment issues with your mom, or you didn't get enough attention during the, uh, 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 the phallic stage, or whatever it might be, uh, and you're fixated on, on the attention of women, or whatever it might be. Uh, that's how they would do it. Uh, that's what a projected test is. So that becomes the uh, overall goal. Uh, and that's kind of what Freud pointed out, if I could kind of summarize it all up, or sum it all up, uh, is Freud not only pointed out that um, we're driven by these, um, by unconscious, irrational uh, forces, uh, but it's the, and that's what we see in our behavior, right? And that's what, uh, which dictates our behavior, which affects or determines even behavior. Uh, but it's our job to uh, figure out across our lives with the help of therapists and whatnot, 
Um, to decode then, job is to decode the unassimilated uh, or um, uh, uh, the unassimilated, no, to decode the maladaptive desires or traumas. Decode the desires and traumas that are, are maladapted through psychoanalysis. Uh, and again, he believes this is a personal thing. It's, it's individual. So we all have our own struggles and set of impulses and desires and traumatic experiences that we have to figure out. And we can use help uh, through these tech techniques and, and all that. But basically, he believes that we're driven by these forces. They explain why we do what we do. Uh, and it's our job to figure out why uh, or, or which desires we're suppressing or, or traumatic experiences we're, we're repressing or, or, or uh, you know, uh, sublimating or whatever. Um, it's a personal mission to do that. And then they're all going to be different based on the, the person. There are some commonalities as far as like general themes, but uh, each person is going to be, uh, it's, it's like a personal journey, I guess you could say, uh, or issue. It doesn't have much to do with your ancestral past or genes. Um, and that's where he's going to be. Well, of course the inherited primal instincts are, uh, but that's where he's going to diverge from his, um, uh, apprentice at the time, uh, Carl Jung, who's going to go a more collective, uh, unconscious route, who is also very much a believer that we're, our personality is dictated largely by these unconscious motives that, that are in us and conflicting and carrying themselves out, manifesting themselves without our knowledge, and that it's our job to sort of uh, uh, go through and, and uh, identify and, and assimilate all those things to, to form our own individual uh, identity or, or self concept of self. So that's that's Freud. Uh, and the next we'll do uh, Jung, and that'll be it for psychoanalysis. The next psychoanalyst uh, we're going to talk about is Carl Jung, which was a pupil of Freud at one point, but the two are going to sort of uh, diverge on their pathways regarding how to interpret um, or apply this psychoanalytic theory. Uh, I think Freud, from what I recall anyway, was hoping he could sort of, Carl Jung could like take over uh, and, and advance this new psychology or, or system of thought. Uh, and um, not that Jung didn't even want to necessarily, but they did have some disagreements on the details and overall structure of how uh, this uh, existence, coexistence interaction of the conscious and unconscious operate. So the <clears throat> there's a lot of details that are different, but the, the best way I could sort of generalize or generally uh, separate the two or distinguish them is Freud believed a lot more in a like a personal unconscious that is uniquely you not that Jung didn't think you were unique but um, it wasn't so much based upon the um, inherited traits or unconscious of, of some sort of collective uh, existence as a species for humans or even our, our other ancestors going back um, you know pre-human because keep in mind uh, Dar Darwin's ideas at this point are, are out uh, it's been about 40, 50 years by the time these guys split Jung and, and uh, Freud in about 1912, 1913 uh, re region. And uh, so we're well aware of this idea of inheriting traits and things like that evolutionarily. Um, and um, this is one set of ideals that will embrace that largely. Uh, in fact, this field is going to largely run counter to the one that's going to be increasingly prominent from like the 1920s, but certainly the 1930s, on to about the 1970s, where uh, a very anti-genetic biological explanation for personality and ability uh, is going to dominate uh, following, of course, the atrocities of the eugenics movement and social Darwinism, and then, the, of course, the, the epitome of that, um, of that catastrophe, or that set of catastrophic ideas would be uh, the Holocaust. Um, so Jung is uh, not going to believe as much in a personal unconscious. He's more so a believer in, uh, in the collective unconscious. So um, what he would, I believe, if I could word it, try to sum up his, his ideals in a couple sentences would be, 
he believed that as a, an individual and as a person, your driving force, your personality and behavior uh, would be the process of individuation, which is like forming your own identity of self with a capital S, um, like who you are as an entity uh, and, and sorting that out amongst a whole sea of unconscious uh, drives and identities maybe even like sub-personalities is a, is, a, is a better way of describing it or a, an adequate way of describing it. And that you have to sort of sift through and find out where you are actually are in that. And that this sea of sub-personalities or, or unconscious drives, motives, and thoughts, and experiences um, were collectively acquired as a species, as humans, and then even going further back in evolutionary history. I'm not sure how much he linked it to pre-human evolution, but it's implied because he does include several unconscious uh, drives that are non, uh, non-human. non They're non-anthropomorphic. Uh, anthropomorphic. Uh, I can't remember the term for it. It starts with a T. Regardless, um, it's um, subhuman, or not subhuman, but non-human. Um, so you would say that uh, your personality and development are driven by the process uh, of individuation, which is again, sort of uh, sorting out your personal identity amongst the uh, many drives or experiences or even memories of uh, a collective unconscious. So again, what I mean by that is uh, he believed that evolutionarily there were different behaviors, drives, memories, experiences, etc. that were like encoded biologically and that would be passed on. And so we as humans inherit all of these common uh, beliefs and ideas and even memories or uh, experiences despite having not carried them out or lived them ourselves. Uh, we know that's definitely not true at this point, but the reason why we learn about Jung is he made an incredibly, again, the details are going to be wrong, like, much like Freud, but he inadvertently sort of gave us the idea, and, and this is correct, that we do actually inherit a lot of mechanisms evolutionarily and genetically um, from our, our ancestors. Uh, because obviously humans didn't exist even 300,000 years ago the way they do now. Uh, you could even put a, an earlier marker than that. But uh, if we go like 300,000 years, you might find the early proto-humans, um, and I don't know all of the various uh, you know, anthropomorphic uh, uh, forms, but um, it, it wouldn't be human necessarily. There had to be some biological changes in the genes that uh, allowed for the creation of new cognitive uh, or even other parts of the body. Uh, changes that, of course, were you know basically put in the DNA, the blueprint, and then passed on, um, and that those can actually affect the way we think. Now, it doesn't mean that somebody had something bad happen to them and that's somehow coded in their genes, and their kids have that memory. That's not what I mean. But you could have a certain behavior pattern or or predisposition for a behavior pattern, I should say, um, or a certain mechanism or way of thinking or perception uh, that again it's not that you're like you know they experience something that gets passed on per se but the way they see the world mechanically uh, through their sensory apparatus and um, you know in their brain that can be passed on and we do know that and I'll talk more about that at the end so do know that he did tap into a what is something that is absolutely true which is uh, as far as we know anyway that you do inherit certain mechanisms that help you interpret and act in the world uh, but it's not that where stuff happens to you and you pass it on to your kids, uh, per se. So, um, <clears throat> the collective unconscious. Again, he did believe this was a, uh, um, a collective unconscious, a sort of reservoir uh, of those mm, drives, experiences, memories, etc. Uh, and that as you developed, you're supposed to, or you, without even knowing it, uh, you are sort of uh, sifting through that to find your own identity and uh, live your life in a way that is most, I guess you could say, meaningful uh, or fulfilling. Uh, but 
the evidence he has for this is actually decent, um, and it's kind of like what we talked about with um, Paul Ekman's uh, cross-cultural uh, emotional expression workings and findings, uh, where he found, of course, that you um, have these universal expressions of emotion that are biologically ingrained, and that's why you see them in all cultures, uh, even people that are natively blind, they still express these primary emotions the same way, like, you know, joy and anger and uh, loneliness and things like that. Um, but the context and details does vary culturally. So you do have like various cultures when certain emotions may not be appropriate to express in public or during certain circumstances uh, or the, um, the events uh, or the, uh, yeah, well, the events is a good word. The events or sequences that trigger these emotional responses might be different, but the emotional responses are uh, pretty much universal amongst humans. It's going to be similar to that. So what he's going to do is he's going to do, uh, make this assertion that we have these collective experiences um, and memories and drives and that they're inherited because there are, even in the early 20th century when they're really starting to for the first time, you know, due to colonialism, which is of course not a good development, um, but one of the good things that does come out of this is it does allow Europeans to go around the world and much better, much more effectively catalog what other cultures are like. Um, so they go, and that, that means, you know, from ones that would be um, considered less, less developed as far as state societies go, and even archaeolog archaeologically finding other things that they didn't have access to in Europe or hadn't found yet in Europe, um, they're going to find a lot of very common features of humanity that go across culture and across time. Um, and what he's going to base his theories on largely are these common themes uh, throughout humanity. And the important thing here is, these are common themes that could not be learned. Like they're, they're, they're just present in and created by humans universally for the most part. Uh, so it'd be one thing if like, you know, you saw a culture do something, so then you replicated it. Like you didn't, that wasn't a natural process. Well, I mean, I guess observing and repeating for humans is certainly natural, but that wasn't your idea, it wasn't original. Um, however, if we could somehow prove that you grew up in this culture and had no contact whatsoever uh, with another culture, like no, no go-betweens, nothing, and you both did se several things exactly the same despite zero contact, indirectly or directly, uh, you could potentially make some uh, claims about how there might be some universal mechanisms that, that uh, uh, play out in human behavior. And then you could say, oh, it's just regional because, you know, they're close, but no, this is just like that except all over the world in all kinds of climates and regions across all ty different times and cultures. So uh, what he pointed to, uh, to sort of mm, suggest this is the way the human mind worked, or at least partly, was uh, the uh, pointing out the existence of several what we call archetypes. So universal archetypes. You're like, what the heck's an archetype? Uh, an archetype is something that, at least the way we're talking about it, is something that exists, it's used repeatedly in some form uh, throughout history or mythology, and in this case, in multiple cultures. Um, so you actually know a whole lot um, without even knowing it, uh, per se. So universal archetypes, you point these out because again, these exist across uh, multiple uh, eras in multiple areas, uh, including people that did not have contact with one another uh, or any form of go-between. So here are some universal archetypes. So again, uh, common uh, representations or themes um, across um, time or mythologically, whether it's historical time or, or mythological time, across history and mythology. Um, it, generally in art, but you can definitely see them in uh, other forms of art, be it visual art or literature or philosophy or whatever it might be. Um, so, um, and that could be even uh, oral uh, storytelling. So these archetypes, some of them are, um, in all cultures for the most part, you've got, despite there being no contact, you generally have some common um, representations for things. So. Every culture, for the most part, has uh, an ideal image of, in their stories, uh, a, the ideal good mother. I don't mean like what they do, or the good father. And again, I'm not saying this uh, is like, this is how fathers or mothers should behave, but in stories, you generally have reference to, like, like say, the characters, this kid. Um, it's very common for there to be 
some form of a good mother or good father that is just benevolent and uh, supportive and wise and there as a firm foundation for the child in the story or, or, or whatever. And for the most part, those characters are largely uh, untainted by civilization or temptation or, or mistakes or whatever it might be. Uh, those are common across uh, themes. And if you want to get more specific too, because um, that's kind of general, they usually also include, and again, this isn't in every story, but every culture has stories with these things in them. Um, the wise old woman or the wise old man is uh, are very common themes. Wise old woman, wise old man. Uh, those are common in stories as well. Um, the uh, idea or representation for nature, like mother nature, as well, I just said, a, a mother, uh, it's a more feminine female uh, depiction. Uh, so the um, nature is often represented by uh, the mother, certainly by femininity, but the mother. Uh, often things having to deal with the future uh, or some sort of organization like time, like father time, uh, those are generally uh, male uh, or masculine features. Uh, so I can just put feminine here instead. Uh, and then things that have to do with uh, the future uh, or even sacrifice. No, not sacrifice. Uh, future endeavors or society. Those are almost overwhelmingly uh, male representations. So I'll actually put masculine. It's probably a more accurate way to do it. Uh, as well as feminine for nature. Those are common. Um, some other common ones are going to be, oh, just the idea of a hero. Um, so there's, you know, it's some character that has to grow or show their virtue or defeat some, you know, great odd or whatever. Those are common across history uh, and mythology, uh, as well as uh, some form of villain, but particularly one that we refer to as the trickster. So this is a uh, an entity that is knowingly manipulating or going against society or the hero or whoever uh, and using their, their, their cunning to break the rules and benefit themselves. Uh, and so a common example is Loki. I'm sure most of you have seen the Marvel movies. Loki is an excellent example of a trickster. Um, you can't always say he's particularly evil in every instance, but he's definitely one that uses his ability and knowledge to, to manipulate things to his advantage. That's what a trickster would do. Um, and then obviously Thor is not exactly a, an ideal representation of a hero, um, but uh, he probably would be so in the earlier movies anyway. Um, but those are also common um, universal themes, uh, or archetypes rather. Um, other examples, because there's a whole bunch. Uh, the idea of um, death and rebirth, and I don't just mean like the Judeo-Christian death rebirth thing, but, but the, the cycle of death and rebirth and transformation, those are also universal. Um, as far as human uh, go. Oh, and uh, life developmental stages, like uh, childhood, uh, as well as um, uh, independence, I guess you could say, leaving one's parents, I'll, I'll say independence. Independence, um, uh, some form of initiation, uh, which have largely been weeded out of cultures, but it was pretty much universal that there was some sort of rite of passage Usually for men, because women's was usually just, uh, they, they centered that around uh, the menstrual cycle. When that began, there's womanhood. Uh, men don't have like a clear marker of like something happens, or boys is when it begins technically. Uh, so they would usually have some sort of rite of initiation where the guys would have to go do something ridiculous and absurdly painful and dangerous uh, to enter manhood. Uh, and you can look at the cultures, and the, and the details vary in all of these as far as what they might look like or might they, what they might exactly say. And certainly in these rituals, what they do uh, but the, the role is the same, uh, and the, uh, just the theme, the, the concept is, is the same. Um, then there's also a, a common themes of uh, marriage as well. Um, there's the themes of leaving your parents, I got the independence already. Um, the concepts of light and dark, with dark uh, representing evil, light representing you know, good, virtuous, uh, those are common across cultures. Uh, what else is common across cultures that is really popular? Oh, uh, regarding stories, um, uh, almost every culture has some theory for creation. Of course, they're almost always absurd because they're made up by humans uh, thousands of years ago that had no idea what actually happened and no scientific uh, tools with which to assess that. But uh, 
uh, this idea of creation. Almost all of them have some sort of uh, understanding or belief in an afterlife, uh, a supernatural force or, or entity, entities is more common, or, or one. Uh, the concept of a god and a devil, pretty, pretty common, uh, even if it's multiple gods or multiple devils, but the, the good-bad sort of thing, dynamic. Um, what else? Um, I'm probably listing more than I need to, but I still want a complete list. Oh, um, this is a common one. Uh, a, a, a type of flood story is common in uh, pretty much all cultures, uh, whether it's you know the biblical flood or different accounts uh, with different versions. Um, like I think one in the Americas was like there was a flood and only one guy lived and then somehow the human beings, I don't know how they explain how humans kept maintaining themselves, but he did somehow. Um, so a common flood stories, like worldwide flood, by the way, not just uh, one. Um, and then creation. Oh, and an apocalyptic. Uh, there's always an apocalyptic one too. Apocalyptic. So this idea of an apocalypse, like there's going to be an end of the world, some terrible event or sequence of events, um, uh, or, or punishment, whatever it might be, uh, the world's going to end. And there, there's a bunch. Uh, I'm not even coming close to listing all of them. But those are common ones that you're probably familiar with, uh, whatever culture you came from. They almost certainly have these elements in them, probably all of them. Um, and that, uh, that was a good set of evidence, at least for Jung, uh, to... Uh, uh, extract or extrapolate these theories uh, from. And they, they corroborate his ideas as well as more discovered as time goes on. He goes all the way to the 60s uh, and all that did was present more examples that would, um, like I said, corroborate or support his, his thesis. Now there's a lot that contradict it too, but uh, as far as this goes, there's plenty of evidence for that. Uh, he also cited too, this isn't like necessarily an archetype, but he, uh, in many cultures, although you could consider an archetype, there's beliefs centered around like reincarnation, like cycles of rebirth or, or experiencing familiar memories or, or sights or visions or whatever, which of course now we know it's more so deja vu than anything, uh, which is, a, which is a, 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 a retrieval error in your brain where your brain rationalizes what you saw as the memory. But uh, nonetheless, uh, reincarnation and um, familiar experience, even though you, know, you never experienced it yourself, Experience or memories um, are um, evidence of to Jung of a collective unconscious. All right, so um, the reason why, no, not the reason why, what he believes impacts your personality is again how you sift through all of these, uh, this, this sea of um, ideas and memories and experiences to extract who you are. Uh, and it also includes non-human things too, like we have common uh, archetypes, representations for uh, things that are uh, evil. So generally speaking, things that are evil or villainous in uh, all stories will be common things like snakes or spiders or dragons, even though dragons don't even exist. Um, those are all common um, representations for things as well. Um, you have to sift through these things uh, to, to, uh, to pick yourself out as an individual. And uh, the things you have to sift through, again, can be even uh, non-human or have uh, non-human characteristics. Uh, one of the things that you have to sift through and figure out about uh, yourself and, of course, what you've inherited uh, was your shadow. Uh, the shadow... Two, and that sounds very villainous and nefarious. Uh, the shadow was, I've read a couple different interpretations of it, but regardless, both of them have to deal with either the entire or just part of, but regardless, it's the unconscious. So you're unconscious. Uh, almost like it's a thing, like it's its own, own entity. Not necessarily just the id, because remember with, with, with Freud, the id is entirely unconscious, and then the ego is partly unconscious. Um, but less so than the, the id and the superego is more conscious. Uh, the shadow would be almost like a part of you that you're not aware of. Uh, and part of your journey in life and individuation process is to figure out which elements of your shadow are impacting your life unknowingly. All right, so the unconscious uh, uh, part of you 
that must be, uh, first of all, acknowledged uh, and then integrated. So first you have to be aware of it. So what are these uh, unconscious drives or behaviors, desires that are uh, potentially damaging? And by the way, even though it, it says shadow, which is, is probably even more, uh, probably another archetype that I don't know about specifically, but the shadow kind of implies it's evil because, um, you know, it's, it's in the darkness. It's not uh, enlightened. It's not, you know, transparent. It's not operating in, in, uh, in full light or full view. The shadow could be good or bad. Uh, it's certainly got elements that are both, but it's going to be darker or more sinister or damaging if you're unaware of it. So if you have all these drives or parts, characteristics of your personality or sub-personalities that you're not aware of or you deny, uh, they're going to exist in you unknowingly and they're going to damage your life when they, when they reveal themselves uh, without you realizing it or uh, in ways that you don't want it to. So uh, you've all heard of the, um, uh, the, the Jekyll and Hyde sort of uh, um, story about how, you know, one side of you exists uh, as this normal per person, but then you're, uh, you know, consumed at some points and taken over by this uh, evil primitive version of you that, that you uh, deny and want no part of. It's kind of like that. Um, you have to be aware of both the Jekyll and the Hyde uh, portion uh, and integrate them and, and, and work with them. Uh, it's almost kind of like, this isn't a very good example or not a perfect example, but like in the Marvel movies, how uh, there's the Hulk that's like this, you know, just runs around breaking things. And then there's this Hulk or, or, or the, um, you know, oh, I forgot his name. I'm totally blanking out on the actual guy's name, on the scientist's name. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I forgot his name. Whatever. There's the scientist, the human, and then there's the Hulk, uh, and they're two different things. And then you never know when the Hulk's gonna show up or not show up. Uh, you never know when you're gonna get the, the scientist, who I can't believe I forgot his name, but I did. Um, uh, but you have to like blend them together, and Marvel didn't do a very good job of this, but in the end, you kind of have that hybrid where it's the Hulk body with his abilities and his, his, his strength and his intimidation, but you've also you know, integrated it with the, uh, the conscious human part that is preserved and, and, and can, can use the abilities wisely as opposed to just randomly. Uh, that's kind of, kind of, I'm oversimplifying, but that's kind of what integrating your shadow is. It's realizing the parts of you that are uh, more primitive perhaps, potentially damaging, but if you can incorporate them to your personality and you're aware of them, uh, you can sort of pull back on it when you need to or use it to your advantage uh, when um, the situation is right. So if you're really aggressive, for example, Maybe that's part of your shadow. You're very violent or aggressive or whatever. Uh, it would be a bad thing if you were unaware of it or if it would appear without you know, your consent or knowledge or uh, awareness and, and potentially cause harm by causing you to lash out at somebody and get in legal trouble or, or even just relational trouble, whatever it would be. Uh, however, if you could tap into that aggression um, at socially acceptable or beneficial points, that would be excellent. So it's not that you should realize you have this aggression and just keep it down forever in the abyss of the unconscious, uh, but rather you should integrate it um, and then use it when it's advantageous. Like, for example, if you're uh, into some sort of sport or fighting sport uh, or uh, use it in a way that's not physically aggressive, but you could use it um, intellectually. Like uh, you could use that aggression and that drive to motivate your work or your study or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, but you can harness those things that could be bad if not acknowledged or integrated. Uh, you could use them uh, to your own benefit and that's, that's a necessary process. Uh, so that's part of the process. Uh, and the other part of the process is, and, and it's different according to him for men and women, uh, you have to incorporate or acknowledge or understand or integrate the uh, feminine side of you, if you're a male, uh, or if you're a female, the, the masculine side of you. Uh, and that doesn't mean that you know, you're equally 50-50 or anything like that, but to whatever degree you are masculine or feminine as a male or female, you have within you a, an unconscious existence of the, uh, uh, the other version. Uh, again, generally speaking, that would be uh, the feminine side for men and the, the masculine side for women. 
uh, in that there was a term for that actually. Um, so there was the animus and the anima. And you have to sort of uh, familiarize yourself with what those things are and then integrate them or understand them going forward. And these are things that would potentially uh, affect your views and interactions of the opposite sex. Um, but you would need to tap into both to fully realize yourself uh, as an individual and uh, tap into your uh, shadow, integrate your shadow to make yourself an actual force in the world. Almost sounds a little existential, but like uh, as in this philosophy, but sort of make yourself a driving force that would be uh, for good uh, or at least find meaning in yourself. So he would believe that if you were a male and didn't integrate your anima, the feminine part of you, or you were a female and didn't integrate the animus, uh, you wouldn't be whole as a person or live up to what potential you had. He did have different dynamics as far as like uh, what it meant for each gender. Uh, and of course, being the early 20th century, there wasn't a whole lot of attention given to the female par portion of it, at least not that I'm aware of. Um, and uh, you do those differently, but uh, ideally, and I'm gonna sum like, not summarize, I'm gonna simplify just to kind of get the point across. Uh, if you're a male, you of course have to integrate the anima, the feminine part of you. Anima. Uh, and to do that would be of benefit uh, because you would tap into the more feminine qualities of human existence, um, which he defines as um, being more aware of or, or in touch with uh, your, your intuitive uh, paradigm, a way, way of thinking about seeing the world uh, emotionally, uh, and you're more open to imagination and creativity uh, is what that would do. So for a male to do this, they would be uh, ultimately more intuitively connected with emotions, uh, imagination, and creativity and creative. Uh, and for females, which he wrote about less, so I don't have as much to go off of here, animus, um, you would have to integrate the, some of the masculine features. Um, which, according to him, would be you know more oriented along um, non-intuitive, non-emotional, maybe even non-creative features. And obviously, we would all disagree with uh, a lot of these characteristics, the way he lays them out. But um, ideally, if females incorporated their masculine side, they would reach whatever their potential was, uh, becoming more in touch with uh, uh, the masculine features, more in touch with uh, masculine features. Uh, to act as, again, integrated, fully creative uh, individuals who are capable of affecting the world uh, and finding their own individual identity. So that's kind of what his set of beliefs were. Um, and I did, of course, over simplify because he wrote, I mean, just endless amounts of pages on this stuff. Uh, and I'm really just plucking the general ideas from them to present to you guys. Uh, but that's kind of the general framework he had as far as his beliefs go. And he had a fair amount of uh, innovative or novel, well, innovative, I'll say, oh, also novel, uh, evidence for that. Uh, so the reason why we care about Jung and Freud too, but we'll talk about Jung because I already talked about why we care about Freud. Freud, again, opened up the idea that we're not purely these rational, conscious beings that were driven also by irrational and unconscious behaviors, which is true. His explanations for why and how were not correct, but the existence of you know, these instincts and predispositions to act certain ways or thoughts or drives uh, that are, you know, uh, embedded in us uh, from the uh, older parts of our brain, older, like, you know, evolutionarily older. Obviously our brain's about the same age uh, from, from when we develop. But um, we do inherit those in the limbic system and, and, and subsystems that influence our behavior, which he didn't describe that as, but nonetheless, that's the case. So he was right about that. Jung is also gonna be right too, in a different way. Again, the details are gonna be wrong, but these common features are undeniable, um, just like the uh, Ekman's discovery on the uh, you know, emotional expression and how that's universal. It's just the, the cultures you know, change the details on the context uh, for when they're appropriate. But um, what Jung's gonna be right about is not necessarily about these parts, although you could certainly argue that this is partly, well, you could argue there's some truth in both. You definitely have to embrace masculine and feminine features to be a well-rounded human who can interact with everybody and uh, successfully navigate the world. Um, and the shadow, there's definitely parts of us that, if not 
integrated properly could actually make our lives worse, um, damaging ourselves or others' or reputations or whatever. Uh, those are certainly true in general, but uh, the things that are actually structurally, psychologically true uh, have to do with these. Uh, and what, what he found was, uh, and again, the details for it are wrong, but he did discover, or, or at least lead us to discover, um, discover the common perceptions, interpretations, and uh, thought patterns of humans. And um, he, he was pulling, obviously, from uh, anthropologists, which, which of course, are going to further uh, corroborate his ideas, confirm them, uh, about when they, when they find that list of, I think it's, I can't remember if it's 200 or 500 youths, human universals that vary in detail, but just like these uh, are similar uh, to the T uh, in, in their overall structure. So this is gonna be confirmed by um, anthropologists. You're also gonna be have this confirmed by evolutionary psychologists as far as how certain behaviors or tendencies or traits are inheritable. Um, obviously there is an environmental influence hormonally, epigenetically, and also cultural too, to some degree. But uh, the fact that it, you do inherit some uh, cognitive faculties and behaviors or, pre or predispositions for those or, or, or uh, you know, preferences, uh, that, that exists uh, evolutionarily and uh, through heredity. And then also um, cognitive science or cognitive uh, psychology or science has also confirmed this. Um, what he found was that these were common ways that humans perceived uh, and operated in the world. So again, the details are gonna vary, but the fact that we see the world the same way and we interpret it the same way uh, suggests that we have a common structure in our brain that takes in information a certain way, uh, stores it a certain way, and it expresses it a certain way. So we do get some uh, variance in detail, but this is a good framework, no, not a good framework, it's a good concept map of how our brain interprets the world and, and our actions in them. Um, that, that feature is common. So it's a lot like with what later uh, Chomsky and, and Pinker and others are gonna find in the 60s and, and 70s and onward about language and how <clears throat> languages vary, like the words in them, and certainly the writing, which is a very recent phenomenon. But our capacity to uh, learn language, not even as learning it, but as growing it, uh, is installed in us, in our software. So you're born, and as long as you're exposed to experience and, and language, uh, your brain takes in the information and intentionally and in the same way uh, absorbs it, represents it, and communicates it. All right, so you do have the variance from culture to culture and what that looks like and sounds like, but the grammatical structures are almost universal. Uh, the ways that we describe things are almost universal uh, as far as language goes. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, common ways we perceive things with Gestalt principles, that's from earlier units, how we all see things as a common unit or pattern or in motion when they may be individual, right? Like the figure ground concept or like if you have a whole bunch of lines put together, uh, that you, you might, you know, if there's like a dot, 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 dot going, you'll see like a snake instead of a bunch of different dots. So the way we perceive the world, uh, and in, in this case, represent it mentally and express it uh, is common. So we do inherit those. And again, the evidence for that is, is, is pretty solid as far as seeing it across culture and time, uh, as well as seeing it, uh, its inheritability and its, uh, how it plays out in our brain when we're uh, utilizing these faculties. So details were wrong, but he does lead to the discovery or, or stumble on or discover uh, this uh, concept that we do perceive, interpret, uh, and express uh, and represent these things commonly uh, as human beings. Um, but the details exactly for how your personality works, and certainly the idea that you can inherit memories or experiences directly, um, uh, you know, uh, through genetics is, is not entirely true. But the way you see the world, interpret it, uh, and your, uh, your predispositions, uh, definitely uh, a lot of that is going to be inherited. And uh, the way it, it develops is obviously going to be inherited too. Um, but we all have brains, but uh, it doesn't matter how you raise a kid, uh, they're never going to develop a cat brain. It's going it's a human brain for a reason. Uh, and that's, these are part of the underlying structures of our brain for how we 
uh, represent uh, and perceive and find meaning uh, in the world and, and describe it and express it. So that's uh, the psychoanalysts who uh, do a pretty good job of stumbling on some uh, new and um, uh, unintuitive discoveries, uh, and that's going to impact and, and um, psychology in leading us back to some uh, realistic uh, biological explanations, and that's going to, of course, uh, mix with the next surge of, of psychological ideas and personality theories, uh, for the uh, which are almost exclusively uh, uh, tied to uh, society and culture uh, and experience. So that's going to be behaviorists and the uh, uh, socioculturalists uh, from the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, all the way to about the 70s, um, when in the 60s and 70s we have uh, humanism pop up and the cognitive revolution, and we start learning how to uh, track and explain traits. So... That's the psychoanalysts, and next we'll talk about behaviorists and uh, socioculturalists.